Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here. Uh, I have divided my remarks in three parts. The first part will be Francis and the, mo and the history of the debate on the reception of the Second Vatican Council. A second part on Pope Francis' emphasis on, on some documents of the Second Vatican Council. And the, and the third part is Pope Francis' reception of the Second Vatican Council as an act, as an event, as a moment in the history of the church. So the first part, the Pope and the debate on the reception of the Second Vatican Council. The conclave of March 2013 took place in a very particular period in the history of the reception of the Second Vatican Council. After a pontificate, Pope Benedict XVI, whose overarching message was clearly about the intention to revisit the Second Vatican Council and its reception and an application in the life of the church. In this sense, the election of the successor of Benedict XVI was clearly, I think, not just the election of the new Bishop of Rome, but it was also framed in the context of the debate on the, uh, on the Second Vatican Council, a, a, a debate which Benedict greatly contributed to shape. The debate had been prompted by Pope Benedict himself at the beginning of, of his pontificate with the famous speech to the, to the Roman Curia on the two hermeneutics of the Council of December 22, 2005, which was also meant to be the, the response to two of of the, of the most important uh, collective works published on the Council uh, between the late 90s and the early 21st century, the five-volume history of the Second Vatican Council uh, directed by uh, Giuseppe Alberigo, and the five-volume commentary directed by Peter Hunermann and Ber uh, Jochen Hilberat in Tübingen. And from 2005 onward, Benedict the 16th interpretation of the Second Vatican Council was very simplistically summarized by some commentators as a polarity between continuity and reform on one side and discontinuity and rupture on the other side. And this simplistic caricature of the hermeneutical complexity of the Second Vatican Council penetrated and shaped the, the language of the discourse of the Catholic Church on the Second Vatican Council, especially, we have to say, at the level of uh, theological studies and seminaries, but also in the orientations and statements of some bishops and cardinals. If we want to be true to that speech of Pope Benedict, the argument of continuity with, 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 the, with the tradition of the, of, of the Council was originally in that speech mostly an argument against the Lefebvrean thesis of the Second Vatican Council as a rupture with, with the Catholic tradition. But also it showed the real objectives of many interpreters of the speech of Pope Benedict the XVI and in some instances of Benedict the, the XVI he, himself, for example, on the liturgy. So all this is a key element in order to understand how Francis theology interacted with the theological culture identified with the papacy in 2013 and in his previous pontificate. And it helps, I think, to explain the reception of Francis in the global church of, the, of, the, of, the, of today. My contention is, is that Pope Francis has inaugurated a new phase in the reception of the Second Vatican Council, and not only for the sudden and complete disappearance of the traditionalist issues from the agenda of the Pope, of the Bishop of Rome. We have to remember that all the, all the, uh, the pontificates in church history since 1939 have been all defined in different ways, different measures by the historical theological debate 
in relation to the object of the Council, Pope Pius XII's decision to not reconvene Vatican I in 1948-1949, to John Paul II, the last pope who had been a member, a, a voting member of the Second Vatican Council. Now, Pope Francis, ordained a priest in 1969, does not belong in this line of popes involved in, in Vatican II for biographical reasons. But there is also, as, as also John O'Malley told us yesterday, there is a specific heritage of the Catholic Church in Latin America and the legacy of Vatican II for Latin American Catholicism in these last 50 years. It is clear that the Argentine Jesuit Jorge Mario Bergoglio perceives Vatican II as a matter that should be not be reinterpreted or restricted, but implemented and expanded. And that was very visible from the very beginning of, of his pontificate. In the early words addressed to the people in St. Peter's Square immediately after his election, on the evening of that March 13th, he presented he, he himself as the bishop of Rome, and the binomial bishop and people is crucial to Francis' ecclesiology, and it's his first way to put an emphasis on an ecclesiology of the local church, and, as, and on Rome as a local church that cannot be misidentified uh, as a casual uh, emphasis, but it's an ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council. One of the things interesting for an historian and or a, 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 a theologian of the Second Vatican Council is that Francis' quotations of the Second Vatican Council have been more rare than those of his predecessors, but they have also always been carefully chosen to mark particularly important moments during his pontificate. Remarkably, the first quotation of, of Vatican II uh, during his pontificate was one week after his election on March 20th during the meeting with the, the fraternal delegates from other churches and religions. Francis mentioned for the first time the Second Vatican Council and in particular the declaration Nostra Etate on non-Christian religions. So uh, this is important because since the beginning of, uh, of uh, his pontificate, the presence of Francis, uh, 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 the presence of Vatican II in Francis was more mediated and non-textual rather than explicit and directed in, in programmatic test. It was always more, it is always more a matter of, inter of implementation than of interpretation of what it means. Hence, it is impossible to assess Francis' relationship with Vatican II simply from the textual references to the Council in the text of Francis' teaching. For Francis' reception of Vatican II cannot be measured in terms of the number of quotations of the Council documents. As a matter of fact, Francis quotes Vatican II rarely, and not more, or I would say less, than his predecessors. But here there is something specific. I, I think there are two particular ways of Francis of reading, using, and living Vatican II. One is an ecclesiological reception of the Second Vatican Council, and second, a, so what I, I would call a generative reception of the act of the Second Vatican Council. So let's start with the ecclesiological reception of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. The two ecclesiological constitutions, Lumen Gentium and Gaudium et Spes, are the most important textual references to Vatican II in Pope Francis' teaching. It can be said, I think, that Francis' reception of Vatican II is ecclesiological in the sense of an ecclesiology for a missionary reform of the, of the church. There is, I think, an ecclesiological intention in, in the selections of these sources in Francis' teachings. For example, 
uh, of the 217 end nodes of Vangeli Gaudium, there are only 17 of 217 quotations from documents issued by the, uh, by the Roman Curia. Uh, and there are 15 quotations from Vatican II, and, but 23 quotations from documents of national or continental bishop conferences. And so this is interesting because Francis receives Vatican II by receiving documents that are a product of the Second Vatican Council. So you see that from his use of uh, bishop conferences, but for example, uh, how he uses Paul the Sixth. So he uses uh, texts that are that that were Paul the the sixth reception of the Second Vatican. So it, it, it is mediated, but so here there are three texts that he uses for his ecclesiological interpretation. And the first one is Lumen Gentium. In the relationship between Francis and, and Vatican II, Lumen Gentium plays a special role. Evangelii Gaudium, which has the value of a foundational document for his pontificate, uh, Francis quotes Vatican II 20 times, and the most quoted document is Lumen Gentium. A, a especially important role plays Lumen Gentium paragraph 12 uh, because it's clear Francis' intent to rephrase the infallibility of the magisterium as based on the infallibility of the people of God in Evangelii Gaudium 119. And I quote, in all the, uh, the baptized from first to last, the sanctifying power of the spirit is at work impelling us to, a, to a, a evangelization. The people of God is holy thanks to this anointing, which makes it infallible in credendo. This means that it does not err in faith, even though it may not find words to explain that faith." End quote. So this passage on the census fide is even more remarkable because as as we know, Evangelii Gaudium 119 is the only passage of the exhortation that talks about infallibility. And it, but it does that in terms of infallibility in credendo of the people of God. Francis' choice is clearly in favor of an ecclesiology of the people as missionary people that in Evangelii Gaudium is more emphasized than in Vatican II itself, for example, Lumen Gentium 17 or Ad Gentis. Pope Francis is not afraid of pushing Vatican II a little further. And so is an ecclesiology that has in mind a practical restructuring of ordained ministry in the church, beginning from the bishops. And there's this famous passage of Evangelii Gaudium 31, and I quote, the bishop will sometimes go before his people, pointing the way and keeping their hope vibrant. At other times, he will simply be in their midst with his unassuming and merciful presence. At yet other times, he will have to walk after them, helping those who lag behind and, above all, allowing the flock to strike out new paths." End quote. So the local level is emphasized not only here in the relations between bishop and the people, but also in the way Evangelii Gaudium operates theologically. The sources of the exhortation presupposes a communio ecclesia, a, 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 a communion in the church that does not absorb the horizontal communion between churches. And so this is one of the unaccomplished tasks of the Second Vatican Council. Pope Francis is clearly aware of, of that, and once again, he makes a step forward in that, in, in that direction. The connection between reform e ecclesiology and local ecclesiology leads in, in Evangelii Gaudium to a paragraph on the reform of the Petrine ministry which Pope Francis articulates as a, a, quote, conversion of the papacy, and with remarkable honesty, he admits that little progress has been made since Vatican II and since John Paul II's encyclical Utunum Sint uh, of 1995. In Evangelii Gaudium 32, Francis writes, quote, 
we have made little progress in this regard. The papacy and the central structures of the universal church also need to hear the, the call to pastoral conversion, end quote. So here, uh, Evangelic Gaudium plays a special role in how Francis announces his vision of the, of the Second Vatican Council. But Lumen Gentium is very, very important also in one document that is apparently distant from the ecclesiological concern, which is Amoris Laetitia. Uh, in Amoris Laetitia, Francis makes, a, I think, a clear step forward in terms of the reception of the ecclesiology of Lumen Gentium. From the, the very beginning of the exhortation in Amoris Laetitia III, Francis reframes the relationship between papacy and teaching of the church. And I quote, I would make it clear that not all discussions of doctrinal, moral, or pastoral issues need to be settled by interventions of the magisterium. Unity of teaching and practice is certainly necessary in the church, but this does not preclude various ways of interpreting some aspects of that teaching or drawing certain consequences from it. End quote. If you compare this with chapter three of Lumen Gentium, you, you clearly see a fidelity of Francis to Lumen Gentium, collegiality, but there's clearly a step forward. The second document that I, I think it's crucial to, uh, to understand Francis' reception of the Second Vatican Council is Gaudium et Spes, which I, I think it's important because it's Francis' gateway to recontextualize the church in the world of today. And this is important because the, uh, the reception of Gaudium et Spes in Francis' pontificate means a remarkable reversal of fortune for the last document of Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, approved on the last day. A reversal of fortune from, from the pontificate of Benedict XVI, who, who quoted Gaudium et Spes a few times, but often in a very critical way. So here, Francis' theological thrust is about the recovery of a Catholic universality that is free from Latin or Greek or, 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 or European universalism. And this is not about a cultural dominance of the church against modernity and against postmodernity. The legacy of Gadim Espes is evident in the famous paragraphs, uh, 222, 233 of Evangelii Gaudium, where we have, I think, a condensed summary of the philosophical worldview or Weltanschauung of Gaudium et Spes in the famous four axioms. Time is greater than space, unity prevails over conflict, realities are more important than ideas, and the whole is greater than the part. So here, I think Francis, he is receiving the core of Gaudium et Spes uh, existential ontological thesis, not just in the realm of the spiritual decisions, but also in the ecclesial and ecclesiastical sphere, the particular and, and, and individual element cannot be absorbed despite the validity of general principles, it cannot be absorbed by general principles. So this is important because in his way of receiving Adam Espes, we have a fidelity to this fundamental thesis of church and world. At the same time, as we saw for Lumen Gentium, there is a step forward. If you picture how Adam Espes and Vatican II uh, draws the picture of the church-world relationship, it can be a sphere or an ellipsis. So here Francis uses another kind of image uh, for the church in this time in, um, in, in Evangelii Gaudium 2.36 of the polyhedron. 
So here I, I quote, because this is one of the most important of this pontificate, I think. Here, our model is not the sphere, which is no greater than its parts, where every point is equidistant from the center, and there are no differences be, uh, between them. Instead, it is the polyhedron, which reflects the convergence of all its parts, each of which preserve its distinctiveness. Pastoral and the political activity alike seek to, to gather in this polyhedron the best of each. There is a place for the poor and their culture, their aspirations and their potential. Even people who can be considered dubious on account of their errors have something to offer which must not be overlooked. So this is, it's not an image that overlaps exactly with uh, the ecclesiological picture that Vatican II has uh, in mind. Here Francis makes another step, I think again, in fidelity to Vatican II, but it's a step a bit further, I, 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 I think. We all know Francis is famous for his anti-elitism, anti-clericalism uh, in some sense, but what is most remarkable for those who have followed the, uh, the development of documents of the Second Vatican Council is Francis' courage in retrieving the almost forgotten emphasis on the poor and the preferential option for the poor that finds in Vatican II its source. Lumen Gentium made, Gedimus Spes I, Ad Gentis III. Here Francis' idea of, 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 of the church is not a pauperistic idea of the church, but it's a church uh, of a very strong relationship between the church and the world. As he said in Evangelii Gaudium 1, 114, Jesus did not tell the apostles to form an exclusive and elite group, and end quote. There's also Laudato Si that, that draws very interestingly from Gaudium et Spes, even though in a way that is typical of Francis does not overload the text with considered quotations, which are mostly mediated through the use of post-conciliar teaching. Again, Paul VI and the National Bishop Conferences. Uh, but it is remarkable that all the quotations from Vatican II in, in Laudato Si, they are all from Gaudium et Spes. This says something, I, I, I think. Um, in Amoris Letizia, again, Gaudium et Spes plays a very important uh, role. Again, here, in the Maurice Letizia, Francis draws from all, uh, all continents, bishop conferences, and so on. But in, in this particular case, Gadim Espes plays a pivotal role. And if you have followed the unfolding of the two synods, 2014-2015, it was basically a debate in some moments, especially on the validity uh, or the date of expiration of God in space, in some points. And so here, uh, uh, Moses Letizia draws uh, for family and marriage, God in space 4850, uh, but also from God in space 22, on Christ, the new uh, Adam, very importantly, God in space 16, on conscience, and God in space 17, on freedom and human dignity. The last document that is important for the ecclesiology of Francis is the, is the Constitution on the liturgy. The reception of the liturgical constitution of the Second Vatican Council presents us with a particular case in the overall reception of the council by Francis. On the one hand, because as we all know, the, 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 the liturgical issue in the Catholic Church has been one of the most affected by the pontificate of Pope Francis' predecessor. And on the other hand, also on the liturgical issue, Francis' pontificate has embodied a reception of the teaching of the council that cannot be 
uh, seen as a reduction of Vatican II to a corpus of texts. But it is faithful to the trajectories of, uh, the, of uh, the Council, and there's no bigger and more visible trajectory opened by Vatican II than the liturgical reform. And so here, questioning the liturgical reform means questioning much more than the liturgical vestments or these kind of things. So this is one of the ways to read one remarkable fact which makes of Pope Francis a mysterious object sometimes for church historians, which is the notable act, absence of quotations of Sacrosanctum Concilium in Evangelii Gaudium. Evangelii Gaudium doesn't quote uh, the, uh, the, uh, the liturgical constitution, even though in, in, in Evangelii Gaudium there's a whole section on the homily. That's, that's it is remarkable. So here, Francis' attention on the liturgical issue and its connections to the, to the ecclesiology of, of the Second Vatican Council are well evident in, in Evangelii Gaudium. Liturgy is, for Francis, evangelization and not part of a power struggle in the church or a way to express an exclusive ecclesiology or to use the gospel to ignore the deep solidarity between the church and the world. And one of the most remarkable, or, or I would say shocking, uh, paragraphs of uh, Francis' corpus of teaching is Evangelii Gaudium 95, and I quote, this insidious worldliness is evident in a number of attitudes which appear opposed, yet all have the same pretense of taking over the space of the church. In some people, we see an ostentatious preoccupation for the liturgy, for doctrine, and for the church's prestige, but without any concern that the gospel have a real impact on God's faithful people and the concrete needs of the present time. In this way, the life of the church turns into a museum piece, or something which is the property of a select few. Um, I can think only of St. Peter Damiani saying something that's strong against certain quarters of his own church. So this is very, very remarkable, I think. In Laudato Si, there that has no quotations from Sacro Santo Concilium, from the liturgical constitution, has a liturgical understanding of the new church world relationship. Talking about creation and the Eucharist as an act of cosmic love. In Laudato Si, quoting again from John Paul II, Francis emphasizes an understanding of the liturgy that, that connects human love and divine love extending the definition of what, is li of, of what is liturgical beyond the boundaries of the, of the liturgical rites of the church. And I quote from Memoris Laetitia 2.15, the procreative meaning of sexuality, the language of the body, and the signs of love shown through married life all become an an uninterrupted continuity of liturgical language and conjugal life becomes, in a certain sense, liturgical." End quote. So what I would like to say, just to close this, this first half, is that we have, in Francis, a very clear, direct reception of Lumen Gentium, of Gaudium Espes, and in a, in a different way of the liturgical constitution. What is remarkable, I have to say, is that in some sense is the polar opposite, not ideologically, but theologically, of Pope Benedict XVI, for whom the most important document of the Second Vatican Council is the only document Francis almost never uses, De Verbum. This is very interesting because it shows that there are differences theologically they, I don't think they can be reduced to ideology or to politics or to, or to, to different church mm -hmm. politics. So here, De Verbum plays for uh, Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger, 
the role that Lumen Gents in Gadamer's past played for Francis. And, and so this is, I, I think, the correct way of understanding theologically their differences or discontinuities. Last part, what I would call the generative reception of Vatican II in Francis receiving Vatican II as an act, as an event, not just as a bunch of documents, but as an act that continues. So here, the marker of Pope Francis' reception of Vatican II is not a textual reception of the council, but a generative reception. In, in his pontificate, the legacy of the council lives not through quotations of the final documents, but in a reception of various conciliar sources in a variety of different ways. And there are three ways, I think. The, the first way is the reception of the texts of Vatican II that do not belong to the formal corpus of the final documents of the Council. And the most important example of this is in Evangelii Gaudium uh, 41, on the relationship between the deposit of faith and the way to express it. Here, Pope Francis quotes, and it's the first time of many times he has done that, he, he, he quotes from Pope John the 23rd opening speech of the council delivered on October the 11th, 1962, Gaudet Mater uh, Ecclesia, which is a key for every historian who wants to understand something of the, of the, of, of the Second Vatican Council. And in Evangelii Gaudium, uh, Pope Francis has a long quotation of Gaudium Mater Ecclesia, and at the center there is an emphasis on on this. At the same time, uh, today's vast and rapid cultural changes demand that we constantly seek ways of expressing unchanging truths in a language which brings out their abiding newness. The deposit of the faith is one thing. The way it is expressed, it's another." End quote. So here, there is the beginning of a pattern in Pope Francis' pontificate that in some important moments, uh, the Jubilee, the synods, the synods, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia is always there. You always find it um, there. Uh, there is another quotation uh, of that speech in, in Evangelii Gaudium 84, where he says a remarkable thing. Quote, 50 years after the Second Vatican Council, we are distressed by the troubles of our age, and we are far from naive optimism. Yet, the fact that we are more realistic must not mean that we are any less trusting in the, in the spirit or less generous. In this sense, we can once again listen to the, world, to, to, to the words of Blessed John the 23rd on the memorable day of October the 11th, 1962, when Pope John said, at times we have to listen much to our regret, to the voices of people who, though burning with zeal, lack a sense of discretion and measure. In this modern age, they can see nothing but prevarication and ruin. We feel that we must disagree with those prophets of doom we're always forecasting disaster, as though the end of the world were at hand." End quote. So here there is, I, I think God and Mater Ecclesia is one of the few sources that are non-Ignatian uh, for how Francis thinks about the Second Vatican Council. I think that by doing this, uh, Pope Francis is somehow reenacting what Pope John the uh, 23rd did, a reorientation of the church's message, thus showing many parallels between his pontificate and John the 23rd pontificate, that kind of shift between uh, a, a theological age and another theological uh, age. Like Pope John, uh, the, uh, the election of Francis took place, uh, took place in difficult times for the church, 
not only for external circumstances, but for the unstated and yet at the same time clear sense of exhaustion of a given paradigm and the need to reframe and rephrase the message of the church in a new language. It is no surprise then that the resistance and fear of change met by John the 23rd at the time of the council is similar in many, many respects to the reception of Pope Francis in some quarters of the Catholic Church of, 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 uh, of today. And I think Francis is very, very aware of this, and he has continued to stress, to stress the parallels between Pope John and, his, and himself after Evangelii Gaudium. There is a very long quotation of Gaudium Mater Ecclesia in the bull of indiction of the, of the Jubilee uh, Misericordia Vultus of April 2015, uh, and, and I just want to read a few lines of that, of that bull, well, where he refers to Pope John. The walls which for too long had made the church a kind of fortress were torn down, and the time had come to proclaim the gospel in a new way. It was a new phase of the same evangelization that had existed from, from the beginning. It was a fresh undertaking for all Christians to bear witness to their faith with greater enthusiasm and conviction. The church sensed a responsibility to be a living sign of the Father's love in the world. We recall the poignant words of St. John the 23rd when opening the council, he indicated the path to follow. Now the bride of Christ wishes to use the medicine of mercy rather than taking up arms of severity. The Catholic Church, as she holds high the torch of Catholic truth at this ecumenical council, wants to show herself a loving mother to all, patient, kind, moved by compassion and goodness towards her separated children, end quote. There's a second way in which Francis generates a new reception of the Second Vatican Council, and it's, if you want, it's the most visible. It's a reception in acts and gestures. His pontificate is part of the new papacy shaped by Vatican II together with the new global media culture, globalization of religion, and the, and the, and the, the comeback of religion in, in international affairs. In this sense, Francis' pontificate is not phenomenically different from the magisterium of gestures of his predecessors, at least since Pope John. But there are gestures that speak in a particular way of Francis' global reception of the message of the Second Vatican Council. And here there's a long list beginning with Lampedusa. It's where Francis does what he does. Uh, so, so there is a semantic of places uh, that makes it very difficult to, uh, to picture Francis doing the most significant things that he does in the Vatican. That, that's his way of reenacting that uh, act that was uh, the Second Vatican Council. What I see there in, in uh, doing his magisterium uh, in a refugee camp, it's the effort that was typical of the Second Vatican Council to recontextualize the church in the world of this day in places that are the signs of this time. So here, uh, it, it, it is generative in the sense that it is faithful radically to the intention and the trajectories, not afraid of making some step uh, forwards. There's a third way of Francis' generative reception, which is a reception of the message of the Second Vatican Council in the new signs of our times. It is the example of uh, the ecumenism of blood that Francis talks about since uh, the beginning of his pontificate. Uh, what Francis called the ecumenism of blood, of 
the new martyrs, is certainly part of the ecumenical outlook for Pope Francis, as he said many times, and especially in his interview with uh, La Stampa in the, uh, the, uh, December 2013. Um, but there is also a reception in Francis of a theological message of Vatican II on ecumenism, on, on, uh, on uh, religious liberty, with the conciliar intuition for the need of a deeper look at the signs of our times in an intertextual reception of the Second Vatican Council. And this is clearly part of the resistance against him. If you have followed in these last few months the theological debate um, or the journalistic theological debate in this country about Judaism and Christianity, Nostra Etate, these things, it, uh, what, what Francis is doing um, uh, is really, really challenging for, for some quarters of the Catholic Church. So here are some conclusions very briefly. Scholars of Vatican II saw in the election of Jorge Mario Bergoglio to the papacy something that eluded those who had dismissed Vatican II as an anomaly in the way Catholicism is supposed to work. Words, symbols, and acts of the 2013 conclave and of the beginning of Francis Pontificate were clearly an echo of the conclave of 1958 and of the beginning of Pope John the 21st Pontificate. Now, there is something especially relevant in this moment of the reception of the Second Vatican Council in what I dare to say is at the beginning of the second 50 years of the post-Vatican II. And I think there is a shift in the status of the council as point of reference for Catholic theologians and for church leaders. So there's no question that all the successors of Pope John were, were Vatican II popes. Paul VI brought uh, the council to a, 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 a conclusion. John Paul I and II were council fathers. Benedict XVI was one of the most important theological periti. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the council, but the election of Francis in March 2013, five years ago, I think has changed the landscape of the, of the church and especially the debate on the Second Vatican Council. Very simply, and I repeat what General Mali said yesterday, we haven't coordinated. <laughs> so here the fact that Jorge Mario Bergoglio Francis is a Vatican II Catholic, but is also a post-Vatican II Catholic. So here, so one of the most difficult things in the debate of the Second Vatican Council is to love Vatican II without hating the post-Vatican II or loving too much the post-Vatican II. This is one of the most, and so here Francis has a liberated relationship with Vatican II and the post-Vatican II he sees no contradiction, no tension, no rupture between Vatican II and the post-Vatican II. And this, I think, has changed the nature of the debate on the, on, on, on the Council. The interpretation of Vatican II as an exercise of textual exegesis made in a historical vacuum is not only a reduction of the meaning of the Second Vatican Council. It is also the most subtle form of rejection of the council. And it's the same form of rejection we can see in those attempts to interpret Francis' papacy outside of a proper hermeneutical framework of the Second Vatican Council. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you see any difference between uh, Francis's view of modernity to his two predecessors? I do. I do in this sense that uh, the 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 way the magisterium 
and be thinking of the two popes before Francis was very much framed by an identification of modernity with a certain narrative uh, of, uh, of a struggling Catholicism. And so the Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment. So modernity in an European, North American context is loaded with an historical narrative. So the most evident thing is that for Europeans or for North Americans, the 1960s, 70s mean, I mean, 1968, the Red Brigades, the IRA, uh, for a, a, a Latin American uh, is, is the beginning of the of, of church liberating itself from the subjection to a neocolonial power. So it's, it is different, not ideologically, I, I think Francis has a very honest and sometimes stark assessment on what modernity is. Uh, like Gadim Espes, but there is a whole existential and historical framework in which you read not just Vatican II, but especially the post Vatican II. So here, our debates, the clash of narratives about the Vatican II is really on the post-Vatican II, on how good, how bad it, it was. Because on the theology of the Second Vatican Council, there's very little against that in, on the market <laughs> of ideas. So here there is a difference. I, I see that I'm not afraid of using discontinuity. I, I think we should use discontinuity, not in the sense there are good guys on one side, bad guys on the other side. I think Francis comes at a time when his narrative of modernity, postmodernity, is more adequate to the church of today. In this, I have no, I have no doubt. But this is one of the problems of Francis' reception in North America, which he tends to be seen as a professional liberal. And he's not. And he's not. But where the whole context is so loaded, is so heavy, uh, the binarism uh, that it pushes that way. So in this sense, reading Vatican II, reading how he reads Vatican II, I think liberates him from this cage that is more political than theological. Sure. So uh, here, Francis doesn't need interpreters and doesn't need me, uh, of course. But this is how I I read his endorsement of the liquidity. So we live. I'm 47. I was born in 1970. I was a freshman in 1989 when Berlin Wall came. You know, so. I feel that I, I've seen a few things. My impression is this, is that the liquidity in, 
the main impression is that now Catholics, especially Catholics, feel in some sense without a home that is either in their country, nation state, in, in a political party, and in their own church. It is more liquid in the sense that there are no affiliations or places where you are supposed to be by default. That is, is something that, that I think marks a real difference between the world of the Second Vatican Council. It was a Europe dominated by Christian democratic parties. Not for long, but that was the world. So right now, if you know how Catholics feel about their nation state in the West, in the West, Italy, who cares, basically? I mean, presidents dismantle the Supreme Court by Ukaze, uh, all this, uh, and there's no sense that this is my own country, this is my constitution. So this whole narrative of on anti-liberalism that is very much a la mode in Catholicism right now uh, is, is a liquidity. And so ideologically, in, in, in Italy for the first time in I don't know, 70 years, we have no party who even tried to gather the vote of Catholics. They don't even try. I mean, who cares? And in the church, this this moment of Francis Pontificate is not against him personally. It's that the globalization of Catholicism is showing a lot of discontents. And they're not just liberals, conservatives. It's a much more complicated Catholicism. Nationalities, ethnicities, areas. That, so I read liquidity in that sense. And in a in sense, I think Francis is saying something that I personally feel, and maybe other Catholics are feeling that I'm not a sociologist, and I'm not an economist. I'm a theologian and an historian, and I see that there are very few points that by default a Catholic is inclined or required to be identified with. That is how I see that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your answers.